Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Batra Daf Kaf. Today's stuff is sponsored by Viti Rosenzweig Konis and loving memory of Sarah Rosenzweig, Bafiti, and David Greenbaum. Today's learning is sponsored by the Hadron Zoom family in honor of so many great joyful events in our Hadron family. Miles Tov to our friend and fellow learner Ruth Leah Kehan on the marriage of her son Ariel Kehan to Miriam Holmes. May their home be a source of peace and love for Am Yisrael. And a huge welcome home to our friends and fellow learners Gita Neufeld and Terry Grabosha and wishes for an easy show into your permanent home in Israel. Removes an inspiration of hope to all of us. Zaltov to each of you and your families. Um, okay, one other announcement um, on July. Th- uh, okay, so first of all, there's I'm going to be going away as usual in the summer. So at the end of July, starting on the 26th, there won't be Zoom until August 28th. Um, so for that month, there won't be daily Zoom. The Shirim will go up early. Um, as I mentioned in previous classes, the dedications for those days will most likely be only in writing. We have dedications and they won't be announced because most of the shirim I've already recorded in advance, um, working on finishing them up. And um, the other thing that's nice to announce is that if anyone is in the Chicago area, I will be speaking there on July 31st in the evening at 7 p.m. So if anybody's there, um, you can let us know and we'll hook you up with the registration for the shiur. Um, you can write to us at info at hadron.org.il and we will... Uh, send you to where to register for the Shior. It will be at 7 p.m. in Skokie on July 31st. So if you have friends around there and you want to tell people about it, um, you can let us know and I'll give you the flyer to share around. I'm not sharing it to everybody on, in Hadron because it's not relevant to most people, but if it's relevant to you, so please let us know and uh, we'll get the word out. Okay. Starting on the uh, bottom of Yud Tet Where are we? We are... In the middle of a sugya that kind of came out of nowhere, you'll see today there's two connections, small connections to our sugya. Um, but Shmuel is quoted as saying that a rakit does not make the size of the window smaller to basically block impurity of a dead body from going through the window to the nearby house. So that means basically, let's just review. If there's a dead body in a house, everything in the house becomes impure. If there's a window, it's a tefach al tefach that leads between that house and the next door house then the impurity will go through that window. If it's less than a tefach al tefach, or the window is a tefach al tefach, but there's something blocking some of the window, that is quote-unquote permanent, because we'll see it's not fully permanent, but mostly permanent for now, then we're going to say that that's going to block it. So comes Shmuel, and he says, which seems pretty reasonable, a rakik, a wafer that's in that window, is not going to block impurity from going, the from the impurity from going, because people are going to take out that rakik, it's incredibly impermanent. That's what we got to so far. We brought a, a brighta, which seemed to say if you have this kupa or chavit, you have a barrel full of figs, or you have a box full of hay, it all depends whether we're judging it by the box, barrel, or by the hay. If we're judging by the barrel or the box, then it's a problem. Okay? They will, right, I'm sorry, then. They're going to, sorry, then it's not going to block the impurity, okay? But if it's the, if it, if the tevin, the hay, or the figs can stand on their own, then we view it as if they're not in a box. Okay, now the box, what's the issue? A box is a vessel, and a vessel carries impurity. Okay, it's one thing I forgot to re- review today, which is the vet, if it's something that carries impurity, that blocks the window, well, since it carries impurity, it's going to become impure from the dead body, and it's going to pass on that impurity through the window, it certainly doesn't block the window from passing impurity. So if it's the box or the or the barrel, well, that obviously has impurity. If it's the the inside, if you could view it as if it could stand on its own, even though it's not, we view it by that. And then that is basically going to be considered a block to which they then ask, why is that any different from the rakik? These are things that are have use. People, If they have use, people will take them out, just like the rakik people will eat. To which they say, well, it must be talking about cases where they're not usable. Okay, they're rotten, they're worm infested. Okay, that was where we ended. Now we're going to have a bit of a problem. We assumed it's obvious that that barrel will become impure from the dead body and then it'll be passed down through the window. And that was what we said about the chavit. But the Gemara is going to ask a question with that. Now there's unique halachot for impurity of vessels depending on what the vessel is made out of. If the vessel is metal, anything touches the outside or or the inside of the vessel, it will become impure. But an earthenware vessel has a unique way of becoming impure. It's only through the airspace, through the inside. If something touches the outside of the vessel, it doesn't make it impure. 
And that's going to lead the Gemara to their first question of today. What is the case? Because again, we assume the vessel is going to carry impurity, right? And that's the whole reason why if the vessel is in there, of course, it's not going to block the impurity from going through. But now the vessel could be in a way that the either, okay, we're going to assume the vessel is on its side and either the opening is on the inside where the, to the house where the dead body is, or the opening is outside and basically you end up with the bottom of the vessel in the house where the dead body is or facing it. So either Puma Lavar, if the opening is outside, then he gufa techots. Then of course the vessel should block the impurity. And we said it doesn't block because it carries impurity. But a klicheris, the haklicheris, and no matamimi gabo. If something touches the outside of a klicheris, that doesn't make anything impure. It doesn't become impure in that way. So basically, it can't be that case. Ella de puma legato. You would have to say that the mouth, the opening, was toward the house inside toward the house where the impurity was. Otherwise, this wouldn't be the case. So what they're basically stressing to you is there's two different ways this could go, and it's not necessarily that the chavit is going to be blocking. Because if there's no opening of the barrel into that's in the house of the dead body, then it actually won't, the impurity won't pass. Or perhaps instead of saying that, you could say, maybe the, the opening was to the outside, but then you would just have to say, you know, who said it was an earthenware vessel? It could be a barrel made of metal. Okay. Usually you think of a barrel not necessarily made of metal, but it could be. It was a barrel made of metal. And then what do we say about metal? Metal becomes impure either way, right? Whether it touches the outside or the inside, and therefore it would be impure. That was the very side point. Now we're going to get to the bulk of today's stuff, which is all this one to a sefta from Ohalo, the same way we brought a difficulty from a Mishnah in Ohalo, we're now going to bring a difficulty on Shmuel, same kind of difficulty, exact same question, just with different sources and kind of weird out there ideas here, or at least the way we're going to have to explain them is going to be a bit odd. But we're basically going to bring a to sefta that says that all these items that theoretically you would think are going to come in and out of the window and are not permanent there, and yet we're going to say that they're, cons- they're, they're going to block impurity from going through. In other words, we're going to say, Shmuel, you said this rakik, which is going to probably come out because someone's going to want to eat it, doesn't block impurity because it's going to come out. And that's your rule. That's your litmus test, right? If it will come out, okay, it won't block impurity. But this Josefta says the exact opposite of you because it's going to list a lot of items that theoretically you would think are not staying permanently in the window, and yet they're going to block impurity from passing through. It seems like a total contradiction to Shmuel. Now, you're going to see the answers and the responses of the Gemara, how they're going to explain each one, and two of them are going to end up connecting with our suya, and that's why we're here, two of the answers. But they're going to be very out there answers, and one could just simply say the simple reading of the mission is not like Shmuel, uh, the Tosefta, sorry, is not like Shmuel. And possibly the Mishnah, because the Mishnah all alone also did really sound like Shmuel. And Shmuel just has some unique opinion that is very difficult to explain according to the Mishnah. So all these explanations, I just want to remind you, are only the way Shmuel has to read the Mishnah. If you don't hold by Shmuel, then you hold that even if it's not permanent, it could still block impurity. Because right now, it's making that window smaller, which actually seems reasonable. right? Shmuel doesn't think that. Shmuel thinks it's not going to block a window unless it's permanently in the window. But one could say otherwise, which sounds like the simple reading of the Tosefta. But we're going to read the Tosefta not in the simple reading because we want to explain the Tosefta according to Shmuel. So, Meitibe. The bright start, the Tosefta starts like this. Asavin shet lashan, vinicham b'chalom. So we're not going to explain it all these things very well until we get to, we're going to go one by one in the Gemara, and the Gemara is going to go through each one. So we'll give a basic explanation, and then we'll understand it better as we go along as to why, the, why they think, why this just have to think that these things actually block. So we now have grass that we uprooted from the ground and we put in the window. Or, oh, or they were growing from the ground right next to the, the wall, grew up and went into the windowsill. Okay, so we have these items that go into the window. The window, again, is one by one tefach. As soon as it's filled with these items, we're going to see the Tosefta rules, they block the window. Little um, handkerchiefs or little pieces of material. Very, I shouldn't even call them a handkerchief. They're teeny. They're less than three by three fingers. Okay, three by fingers. We mean the width of the, the of three fingers of mine. Okay, so if they don't have three by three fingers, 
then this is what we call not ra'oy l'kabel tum'ah. It's not usable for anything really, anything real that would make it susceptible to impurity. In order for something to be susceptible to impurity, it needs to have significance. This is not significant enough. That's the size for a piece of you know cloth. So a cloth that's not three by three that's in the window is going to block the window. Because again, once it's three by three, it carries, it could become impure. Once it becomes impure, remember, it'll become impure from the dead body. And of course, then it won't block impurity from going through. Of course, the impurity will go through. But once it's less than that, that will block the impurity. Now we get to the strange cases. We have a limb or some skin or some flesh, sorry, of the animal that's a little detached from the animal and hanging over the wall. So the animal, I guess, is on the ground and part of the animal, you know, let's say its arm is like hanging on the window. Okay. So that also blocks impurity. That's a bit weird. I mean, of course that's going to move, right? It's attached to the animal. Or a bird that's sitting on the windowsill. A Gentile that's sitting in the window. Why a Gentile? Because a Jew becomes impure. A Gentile, by Torah law, doesn't have impurity of, from dead bodies. They don't become impure. Okay, me to Rabban and they were goes there that all of Echohavim were like a Zav. But for this purpose, since we're talking about Tumah of a mate going through, and we're talking on a, on a Torah level, so since they don't carry impurity, so they're not Makabal Tumah, and right now they're blocking the window. Ben Shmona, Munach Bechalon. Now, uh, a person carries impurity. But a Ben Shmona, this is a weird case, and we've talked about this before in the Gemara, which is their understanding, it's not true nowadays, obviously, but their belief, or maybe it was true then, I don't know, I can't tell you what really happened, but their assumption was seven-month babies could be a premature baby that could survive. Nine-month babies are regular-term, full-term babies that survive, but a baby born after eight months is not going to survive. That was an assumption they made. And therefore, a baby like that is basically, we assume it's going to die within the first 30 days. And therefore, it's not considered like a live human being that would carry impurity. So if you had a baby that was, eight day, that was born in the eighth month, in the windowsill, that would block the impurity. The hamelach, who klecheres, who sefer Torah, the last three, salt, an earthenware vessel, or a sefer Torah, it's in the window, blocks impurity. Kulan, mematim b'chalon, here we get the ruling, even though I told it to you already. All of these make the window smaller. So now we're going to get to a big question about what's going on. Yes, the animal and the limb is alive. Okay, any questions you have, we're going to see. We're going to go through them as we get there. Uh, but there's still more of the Tosefta. Okay, if you have snow, hail, ice, or frost, or hamayim, or just water. Okay, those are all going to melt. Or the water is not considered significant. It doesn't block the window at all. Okay, now we're going to start with our big list. We're going to go one by one and say, wait a minute. All these things are going to come out of the window. Okay? What, what are you going to do with it? You're going to take it out and feed your animal the grass. Totally usable. Well, Rashi explains that it's a poisonous, a poisonous uh, uh, type of grass that basically if you feed it to your animals, your animals will die, and that's what we're talking about. Only if it's poisonous, Will it not be able to? Okay, you can already see we're getting a bit extreme here. Instead of just grass, we now say poisonous grass. Okay, how much grass is poisonous? I'm not sure. Okay, next. Um, now, here comes the first connection to our suya. If you have grass that's growing near, right? There, we're assuming, okay, there's a window. That means there's a wall. The wall has a window in it. The grass is growing next to the wall, and that's how it got into the window, because it grew up and went through the window. If that's the case, of course you're going to uproot that grass, because it's going to destroy your window. Remember, we said anything planted within three, um, would destroy your wall. Anything within three tvachim of a wall will, right, remember, you plant something, the, the ground is going to have holes, it's going to cause some you know, movement under the ground, it's going to shake the foundations of the wall, and it's not good for the wall, so of course you're going to take that out of the ground. So why would we say it blocks the window? Again, this is all according to Shmuel. According to Shmuel who said, anything you're going to take out of the window, which here you're going to definitely cut the grass, you know, uproot it from the ground. So why would it do that? I'm a rabbi, but kota horba. The first answer is, it must be a wall that you don't really care about. It's a, it's a wall of an abandoned, you know, or a, an old house. Okay? And then there was a dead body in the house, and there's a next door house, you know, space. And the whole question is, does it go through this wall? But it's a wall you don't really care about. Or Rav Papa, Amara, feel the Kotel Yishuv, even if it really is a regular wall. 
בבאין חוץ לשלושה לחלום. You could say, wait a minute. The grass could be coming from being planted with farther than three away from the wall and still could grow and go into your window. So he comes up with a case where it's not growing right next to your wall, but it does come through your window. That's definitely possible. Okay, Matzaloniot. So now, well, this isn't the Kabotuma because it's not usable, but actually it can be used as a patch. If you have a tear in your clothing, you can use it as a patch. And because of that, you're probably going to take it out of the windowsill. So again, it's usable for something. Bismichta. It must be thick material that's not good enough, that's not relevant to use as a patch. If you remember those patches when we were kids, they used to have these patches. I haven't seen anything like that nowadays. I think people just buy new clothes. But, you know, it used to be common. People would put patches, like your jeans were ripped. Now people wear ripped jeans. But in those days, you would actually patch it up when your jeans ripped. Now you buy them with tears in them. But anyway, um, so those patches are always thin. You're not going to put a big, thick piece of material. Chazul umana. Well, the blood letters, which we're going to have two stickers about blood letters today, two issues. Blood letters would use a thick material to basically clean the blood off the, the patient. So they say biriska. Now, maybe it's talking about a thick material that's like a sack, like a sack, which is, right, think about those sacks of potatoes. They're very, um, they're um, rough and they'll scratch the person if you use that. It's abrasive. That's the word I was thinking of, abrasive. And it'll basically scratch the skin of the person that you're using it on. So they say, wait a minute. If you're talking about sackcloth material, well, then the measurement for that is not three by three. In terms of impurity, the, the, the size for impurity is different depending on what the material is because a material of sackcloth is really not usable at three by three. A small piece of cloth is usable at three by three. You can use it. It's, you know, there's all kinds of uses that come up with it, why you would use it. But a sack, you wouldn't use it unless it's four by four. So, if it was talking about sackcloth, then it would say four by four, not three by three. So, you can't say it's sackcloth. That's, you're coming up with an answer to resolve Shmuel, but you're raising another problem with this Tosefta, which is the measurement of four by four doesn't match. To which the answer, and they're going to have a similar type thing later on with another one, ke'en risaka. We mean... It's a thick, abrasive material that's similar to a sackcloth, but not sackcloth, and therefore it would still have the measurement of three by three. But, okay, it's hard to really explain it that way because once it's thick and abrasive, then it's not really usable for three by three. But anyway, that's their answer, and they come up with some explanation. Okay, now we get to the more strange ones. So we have an animal that's standing next to the, the wall, there's a part of the animal, let's say the, the front leg is hanging on the window. Okay, let's just say it like that. And then we're going to say that blocks the window. That's very strange. Ar kava'aza, the animal's going to get up and run, right? Okay, this reminds us of our sugu with the sukkah and the, and, the, and the elephant functioning as a wall of a sukkah, right? We had a bunch of, we also had them functioning as a wall for other things. So bikshua. Okay, and that's what we always end up answering. The animal must be tied. Otherwise, there's nothing to talk about because for sure then the animal will move otherwise. Okay, who tied the animal? Why they tied an animal? Good question, right? Um, we're going to get to Tsar Balei Chaim, okay, about pain to animals. Don't worry, but this somehow isn't considered um, under that category. Shachitla, but wait, but you might slaughter the animal. In other words, the animal might be tied, but you can untie the So the animal won't be able to get out on their own. But you will likely untie the animal so you can slaughter the animal because that's what animals are used for, for eating. Well, it's me'ah. We must be talking about a non-kosher animal. Okay, still, you can still sell it to a Gentile. You know, it's too lean, the meat. There's almost nothing on it. Okay, we're talking about an animal now. It would have to be tied up, not kosher, and very lean. But there's almost no meat on it. It's not worth it. Okay, but what about this limb that's on the, the window? Theoretically, you can cut that limb and give it to a dog, right? Dog eat, dogs eat bones, right? So you could cut the limb, give it to a dog, and then obviously it will move. So again, we have a use for it, to which the Gemara answers, since we're talking about a live animal, to cut off a limb of a live animal, to give to a dog to eat, that's, not, that's inflicting unnecessary pain on this animal, and therefore you won't do it, okay? And therefore we're not worried you're going to do something that's against the law and, you know, inhumane to animals. 
So again, a bird in the window. Okay, we all know birds fly. It's definitely going to fly off. It's not going to last there very long. Because sure, again, we're going to assume the bird is tied down. Shachile, but still, even if it's tied, same as before, you might slaughter the bird. Well, but tell me, it must be a non-kosher bird. Mizabele lenochri, still you could sell it to a, a Gentile. Beklanita. Be okay, it's talking about a klanita bird, which is a type of bird that's too thin. There's not enough meat on it. Nobody eats the bird. Yav leli yinuka, well, you could give it to a kid to play with, right? Like kids have parrots and things like that. It would be a fun bird. Well, bimisaret, it's a bird that scratches. So your kid's not going to want to play with a bird that scratches. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're answering answers that are totally contradictory. Just like we have before with the matlit, once you said it was made of sackcloth, then it doesn't fit in with the other part. This also, if it's misaret, kalanita lo masarta. First you said it was a kalanita. Now a kalanita bird is a nice bird. It's not a scratching kind of bird. So you can't say in, in the same breath, it's a kalanita that scratches. Those two th- things don't go together. To which the answer, just like they did with the, with the sackcloth, ke'en kalanita. We're saying a kalanita is just an example of a bird that is used that is too thin, okay? So we'd have to pe- find a bird that's too thin that also could scratch, and that's why we're gonna leave this bird in the window because it really has no use, not as food and not for kids to play with. Now we're moving to the Obey Kochavim. Obey Kochavim sheyashav v'chalon, kai v'azim. Okay, the Obey Kochavim is gonna get up out that window. They're not gonna stay in the window forever. Bekafu, again, we're talking about someone who's tied. Ate chav reshari le, okay, they can't get up themselves, right? I'm thinking of a game of tag, right? How do you get out of tag if you get caught so somebody lets you out somebody tags you back and then you can get out so someone will let them out bimitsora well maybe it's a leper okay we're really getting extreme here in our answers it's a leper and nobody wants to go near a leper what do you mean there's other lepers who have no problem going near other lepers so maybe a leper friend will untie the the gentile and now we get to what on earth this gentile is doing tied there it's not like a jew tied him up could be the Gentile was tied up based on a king's decree, in which case, even if there were another leper there to untie, or now you don't even need the answer of it being a leper, no one's going to untie this Gentile because they'll get killed by the king if they untie the Gentile that the, you know, that the king said needs to be tied up. And that's why the Gentile will stay in the windowsill. Okay. Again, we're getting a bit creative and uh, a bit extreme answers here. Now we're getting to the real one that's the hardest one to swallow, which is this Ben Shmona. Again, it's very hard for us to understand, but they just assume this is a baby that's never going to survive, has zero chance of survival. Zero. Okay, we're not talking maybe the baby will survive. Zero chance of survival. Who's Munach Bechalam? Ati Ime Daryale, but maybe the mother will come and take the baby, right? Even though the baby's not going to survive, a mother's feelings with the baby, you know, and the mother might want to nurse the baby. The mother has all sorts of reasons to pick the baby up. Well, Bishabbat. And now we learn that permanent doesn't mean permanent. Permanent means temporarily permanent, which means on Shabbat, we're going to learn, and this is a very crazy halacha, a ben shmona, shmona, okay, uh, again, this doesn't mean an eight-day-old baby. It means a baby born in the eighth month is muktza. You cannot pick up the baby, okay? So what do you do? Detanya. Ben shmona haleyu ke'evin. The right says an eight-month baby is like a stone because it has no purpose, right? Not that babies have purposes, but... Baby's a baby. You can move the baby. You can do what you want with the baby on Shabbat. They're not mukta. But if it has no purpose because the baby is basically considered like dead, okay, because they're not going to survive, it's like an Evan, a stone, which is the highest level of mukta, which has no purpose whatsoever. Shabbat, and therefore you can't carry it on Shabbat. So what does the mother do? How does the mother nurse the baby? Well, we allow the woman to go near the baby, lean over the baby, kind of complicated, and nurse the baby like that. Why? Because of the sakana. What sakana? Not sakana for the baby, because the baby's going to die anyway. Sakana for the mother, because the mother gets, um, I forget the word now, so many years, but engorged, right? Is that what it's called? Um, where you're, you have too much milk and you have to, you have to uh, let it out. So because of that, and because she can get an infection, yeah, it is engorged. Thank you. Um, so because of that, you have to allow the mother, otherwise she'd get an infection or something. Or it's just simply uncomfortable. Okay. Now we're moving to the next one. So we've dealt with all the crazy examples. Now we're up to salt. And here's going to be our second connection. The first connection to our studio was the grass growing right next to the wall, which we eliminated because we said perhaps it was growing distance from the wall. Melach, we also have salt, which ruins the wall. So first they're going to ask about salt. What do you mean? You could take the salt. Again, you have salt sitting on the windowsill. We're going to take it and use it. 
We're talking about very bitter salt. It's not edible. You can use it to, to, to tan the leather. Hides. It has thorns in it. And because there's thorns mixed in with it, so you won't use that. But wait, this goes back to our sigya. Salt will either erode away the wall or, you know, maybe create heat. Something that's not good for the wall. So you're going to move it so as not to destroy your wall. Well, it's sitting on a shard. So we have a little shard. It's sitting on top of the shard. And therefore, it's distanced from the wall. It's not going to erode away the wall at all. And that's why you're not going to move it. To which the Gemara then says, why don't we say then the shard is making the window smaller? Because the shard itself, right, it's just a piece of, sh- of, of earthenware vessel, but it's a broken one. So it doesn't, doesn't have impurity. It doesn't uh, accept impurity. But it will block this wall. To which we move now to Amabet. Delay Bashiwa. We say, well, it doesn't have enough of an amount to block the window. Okay, which could be which could mean, let's say, that the window was a little more than a tefach al tefach. This shard didn't cut the, right? It didn't make, make much of a difference. It was a little shard. It wasn't big enough to make the tefach al tefach any smaller. So it's still, you know, if it was a little more than a tefach al tefach, maybe now it's exactly a tefach al tefach, right? Again, one hand breaths by one hand breath. But, right, if it were a big shard, and the, or if the window was exactly a tefach by tefach, and this little shard got in the way, then it would. But this must be a case. The salt is on a shard. The salt together with the shard would be enough to block. But since the salt is considered permanent, they're right. So the salt is going to block the impurity and make it smaller, but not the shard. Okay. So now they say, Kiditnan. Now, it's a little unclear why they bring this mission. The, the commentary has all raised questions here because this is a totally different. It's just talking about how shards could be very small. Okay. It seems to be saying that. It's unclear exactly why they're bringing this. But this is an issue in a Shabbat. In a Shabbat, we're talking about carrying. If you're going to be obligated, you're not allowed to take something from one domain to another, right? Or carry something four cubits in the public domain. But if you are going to be obligated for, let's say, taking something out of your house into the public domain, it's only if it has use. Like, let's say you have crumbs in your pocket. Crumbs are useless. So, right, little teeny crumbs, right? But you have a Cheerio in your pocket already. Someone could eat a Cheerio, okay? So even though it's small, it could be eaten. So the question is, like, there's a whole discussion of Masechah Shabbat for a lot of things, what is the amount that makes this already forbidden to carry? So it says, Okay, so they're saying the uh, earthenware shard, what's going to make it big enough? If you can use it in between beams or pillars or things like that. I was thinking, sometimes you go particularly to a restaurant, although it could happen in your own house, the floor is uneven, right? Often restaurants, if you're outside, the floor is uneven. And then they put something underneath the table to prop up one leg so that it's all evens out. So something like that, where Raj explains a little bit more complicated than that, but you put it, say, underneath something, and then you put some teeth in between, you put some, some clay, you know, and, or, uh, you know, or pitch, and then it all kind of comes together. But it's used for, like, to even things out. Okay, that's the basic idea. If it's big enough to be used for something like that, then it already has significance. So what they're getting at here is that there's some cheras that are very small, Maybe, you know, and maybe like this, it's very small, but, you know, it, it doesn't have enough. It's so small, it could be used to put the salt on top, but it's so small that it's not going to close up your window or be considered, right, to limit the space. Okay, now we get to the last few cases, the klecheres. We have the salt, the klecheres, and the sefer Torah. So now we're up to the second to last. An earthenware vessel, this is not a shard, this is an actual vessel. What do you mean? You're going to take out that earthenware vessel and use it. So if there's an earthenware vessel in the window, okay, you're going to take that out. So why do we say that it's going to block? Well, Dimitanif, it's disgusting, okay? Could have had, remember we talked about when you have um, these earthenware vessels they would use for candles, so they would put oil in them, and then once you use them, they became disgusting. So, you know, perhaps it's disgusting and you wouldn't want to use it. Now we go back to the blood letter. The blood letter sometimes uses these disgusting, dirty utensils to catch the blood in them when they would take the blood out of people so they would put the blood into there so diminutive you would have to say it has holes in it and therefore the blood's going to drip through it's not very usable safer torah okay safer torah this is weird I mean, of course you're going to take out a safer torah how's it the you can use it for reading bibaloi well it's worn out the habai geniza well then it needs to go into geniza right which we usually assume means burying in the ground well shantehe genizatan this is an interesting thing if they look this up with halacha this works 
But apparently by leaving it in the window, that can be considered a geniza of the Torah. It's like designating a place for it where it's going to stay there. So there you ended our all our questions. Again, we went through every single item in this Tosefta, which each one seemed to go against this halacha of Shmuel, that the rakik, basically, if you take out the rakik, I'm sorry, if, because you're going to take out the rakik, it therefore is not considered a block for the impurity, and therefore impurity goes through the window, and yet all these items, which really seem like things you're going to take out, according to the Tosefta, are going to block impurity. Why is that? Each time we had to give a different explanation. And again, the connection to our sugya were both the grass growing near the wall connected and the salt on the wall which connected, which both those, we came up with solutions. One that it was planted with three tefachim away from the wall and just kind of draped over into the window. And the second was that the salt was on the earthenware shard, so it wasn't wearing away the wall at all. Okay, moving on. Not yet though fully, because now we're just talking about salt since we're on the topic of salt. And salt, can you use salt to form a wall, a machitza? Okay, where machitza is relevant in a bunch of different halachot, um, most particularly in, in, um, in, well, first of all, in sukkah, for example, or in eruv. So, amarav, bakol osim machitza, chutz mi melech urevav. You can make a wall out of anything other than salt and fat. Okay, fat, you know, you can imagine it all kind of melt. And salt doesn't really stand. Now, the problem is what kind of salt, and there's different kinds of salt. We get to this. Shmuel Amar Filumena. Shmuel said, so Rav and Shmuel have a debate about whether salt can be used for a wall or not. So Amar Papa Velopli. Our Papa says there's really no machloket. They're each talking about different kinds of salt. Ha Bemelach Stoni. We know that Lot's wife, according to the tradition, was turned into a pillar of salt. That clearly was standing. And if you've ever been to the stone area, you see formations of salt that have stood for generations. So you can imagine why the Melach Stomit could be, right? The Melach from the stone area could be used as a wall. And Haba Melech Istrokanit, which is different kind of salt. We're going to see it's not like table salt. Okay, it's big particles of salt, but not as solid, but they don't solidify like the stone, the sodomite salt. However, that's her purpose resolution, where he basically says there's really no machloket here. They're just each trying that a different kind of salt. But now they say, Hashad Amar Now that we heard that Rabbah said the following, when it comes to um, uh, an Eruv, what do you need? You need what's called a Tsumata Petach. You need something that looks like an opening, and we have two pillars with a with a beam going across. So Rabbah said, You can make two pillars of salt with a beam going across them, a beam not made out of salt, going sitting on top of them. The Korah can can basically stand on the salt. The salt can help you know, support it. And the korama medetet melech. What makes the salt stay in place? It has a beam on top of it. So the two work together. It's like one of these, you know, physics kind of things. Before we were talking about chemistry, there's a little more physics, which is, right, the, the pressure of the beam on top of the salt keeps the salt in place. And the fact that these two beams are on the ground keep the beam in place. So we have this circular thing going on. So once we say that, and that's not melech stomi, because Melech Stomi can stand on its own. This must be the Melech Yisrochani. So once you say that, you can say, I feel Melech Yisrochani, but lo If there's something heavy pushing down on it, kind of keeping it in place, then you can say even Melech Yisrochani, and that that's what the one who said that you can use it as a machitza, Shmuel, was talking about that. And Rav was talking without a beam on top, so that's a different way of explaining the contradiction, or the fact that there is no contradiction, right? I should say the debate wasn't a contradiction in the first place. We thought it was a debate, and then we could say it's not really a debate. Okay. Now we're back to the end of our Mishnah. But this will finish up this section. These were the two parts, the bottom part, the most on them, the top part. The bottom part was wider, the top part was narrower. So it'll be three from the bottom part and four from the upper part. My time, we assume it's because of the vibration. Okay, It makes movement and the movement shakes the wall and weakens the wall. But it says in a different source, in a Pratanitic source, now, this is a different kind of millstone that you the top part is moved around by a donkey. And the names of the parts are different. The istrobiel is the bottom part. So it will be three from the bottom part and four from the top part, because that's the narrower part, the kelet. And there there's no vibration. It works from the pressure. The donkey moves it around and it has a different mechanism and it doesn't have this shaking, vibrating thing going on. So, hata my tiria ika. There is no tiria. So, what's the reason there? Elamishum kala. It's because of the noise. Because it makes a loud noise, and the noise causes the, the weakening of the wall. 
Et ha tenor, shlosham in a kilia, shehem or ba'am in a safa. So remember, we talked about this rim, and there's the, the belly of it. Unclear whether the rim is the bottom rim or the top rim, there's a debate, but either which way the rim is narrower. So it's three from the belly and four from the rim. Am rabbayish, mami you can learn from here the kalia de tenor tefa. You can learn from here that the belly of, a, of an oven is always one wider than the rim. What is this relevant for? Again, for business dealings. If you buy something and then it turns out that the, the belly of your oven is narrower than one tefax more than the rim, you can claim, hey, this isn't big enough. New Mishnah. Now we're getting to all sorts of other things. Back to our topic that one can't do to bother the neighbor. Now, in this case, we're going to be talking and we're going to even quote, we, we actually saw some of this in Baba Metziah when we talked at the end about the Bayid and the Aliyah. There's a person living downstairs and a person living upstairs, and the person living downstairs has to ensure they're not causing damage to the person upstairs. So, lo yamid adam tenur betoch habayit, elim ken yeshel gabav gova arba amot. You can't put an oven in your house, that's why often they did it in the courtyard, because you have to worry about the smoke going up to the, right, ruining the ceiling of the upstairs person, the, sorry, the floor of the upstairs person, which is your ceiling. So you have to distance it four cubits from the ceiling. Hayam amido ba'aliyah, if you're living upstairs, you have to build something three tefachim high off the ground to basically prevent it from ruining your floor, the floor, which is the ceiling of the person below you. Ubi kira, if it's a kira, which has less heat than a tefach, only a tefach off the ground. V'im hizik, right? And you have to put plaster there. That's the ma'aziva. V'im hizik. Now, finally, we're getting to what if you damage. Until now, we keep just talking about preventing damage. Nobody really talks about what if it did damage. Well, if it damages, mishale mashi hizik, Okay. If you did this and you separated it, the three tefachim, the one tefach, whatever you were supposed to do, the four amot, and it damaged anyway, you still have to pay for damages. This is all just to prevent. But if it causes damage, it causes damage. However, Shmuel, uh, sorry, Rabbi Shimon is going to disagree. Rabbi Shimon, Omeo, lo amor kol ashirim ha'elu, el ha'shem yisik, patur me l'shalem. What do you mean? If you follow the rules the rabbis instituted and you distance it the way you were supposed to distance it, that was to protect you from being sued by your neighbor. Okay, so you say, I did everything I was supposed to do. I don't have to pay for damages. And that's a fascinating machloket about if I, if I kept all these rules, right? Is it, did I do everything I'm supposed to do? Or if I damage anyway, well, I'm still responsible. Okay, moving on though. Lo yiftach adam chanut shal nachtomim v'shal tzavaim tachat otzaro shal chaviro v'lo refe paka. If you have a storage house upstairs, okay, we're going to assume it's like grains or olive oil or wine. You have a storage house upstairs and I have, a bakery downstairs, I'm not allowed, or I have, or I'm a dyer, where I'm cooking up the, the dye. So because of all the smoke, it's going to affect the stuff that you're storing, and I can't do that. And not a refit pakar either, because the odor of the of the animals, the cattle, is going to ruin your stuff. But but the truth is, when it comes to wine, if you're storing wine, it's okay. I have a low refit pakar. The smoke is not going to bother the wine. In fact, they even say it's good for the wine. But the, the odor of the cattle is definitely going to ruin it. Now the Gemara asks, okay, that was the Mishnah. There's a different writer that says for an oven, it's four. For a kira, one burner, it's three. <clears throat> and ours says three tefachim and one tefach. And this says four and three. So, Amar Abayi, Kitan Yahi B'tanach Tomim, D'tanur Didan Ki Kira D'nach Tomim. Abayi says there's a difference between a regular oven in an oven of a baker. An oven of a baker, it's going all day or it creates more heat. So because of that, their oven, their um, kira is like our oven. <coughs> so their one burner is more hot than our regular oven and therefore their kira is three tefachim, our oven is three tefachim. Okay. Lo yifta chanut, Tana. So now we bring a bright to the expands on this. Imay tarefet kodemet lo tzal mutal. If I rev my cattle in my house, and then you decide to turn the upstairs into a storage area, that's not my problem. I was there first, I get to do what, what I did. As a result of that, we have a slew of questions now. Baya, baya, kibay b'ribet slo tsar mahu. What if I, what if you came along, <coughs> swept out the upstairs and got it ready to be an otsar, but it wasn't yet an otsar. You just cleaned it out to be a storage area. And then I come and put all my cattle in. Does that mean I did it before you? Okay, we're going to have all these kind of questions. What if you opened a lot of windows upstairs, which basically means open holes in your wall, because you wanted to have an airy space so that it wouldn't be moldy when you store your stuff. So again, you did preparatory work for an otsar, but you didn't actually use it yet. 
Some people think that the hollow note is the downstairs person. If I open windows to allow the smoke to go out the windows and then it wouldn't go as much up, that's a whole different story. And that reading works better with the next question because the next question seems a bit different than all the rest. The simple reading of this is, we thought it was a house with a second floor. What if it was my house? Then there was a second floor, which was a portico, which means it was open on all sides. There were no walls. And then above that was your, was your storage area. Would that be enough separation? Okay, that's a little different because the question seemed to be of the, of the type of what if I built mine before you and what's considered before you. So some people say what this means, or, or uh, the truth is this doesn't really relate to either which one, um, but it could be it's the downstairs for ventilation and then it's similar at least to the hollow note. Then those two go together. Otherwise, this one's really different than all the rest. But if you say the downstairs area was just a portico where it was open on all sides and then there, there's a lot of ventilation and the smoke goes out the sides, then is that okay? And then those two are a bit of a different type. If you say it's the hollow note and it's all preparation for the storage area, then the Asadra question is totally different than everything else here. What if, in your preparation for building a storage house, you took you own the second floor and then you built this area right above the second floor, which is what a lot of people did often on the roof, that was clearly a storage area. Would that be considered already that you built it and therefore, you know, I can't put my bakar there? Take them. So we don't have answers to these questions. What if you use this storage for dates and pomegranates, which really don't rot from these things, but maybe you'll later put the grains and the oil and the things that do rot. So we don't have an answer. Take it. This is where we see it, that the yain is actually good for it, the smoke. Below But that causes a really bad odor, the refe pakar. And now comes Rabbi Yosef and says, a very interesting line, Hi, I'm Rabbi Yosef. Hi, D. Dan. Afilu kutra de shraga nami kashale. But nowadays, this mission is not relevant anymore because the way we make wine, apparently, he's saying in Babylonia, even the smoke from a candle, which is a bit extreme because what? No one's going to use a candle in their house. But even the smoke from a candle could damage. And therefore, you know, it wouldn't be true that this isn't true for wine. Okay? Um, why it's different. So some people say just, you know, they made wine differently in Babylonia. It was a whole different process. And therefore, some explain that we're talking about even in Israel after the time of the temple and there was some miracle in the temple, times of the temple that goes with those miraculous things during the time of the temple. The wines in Israel were, you know, the, any smoke would actually make it better and it was somewhat, being somewhat miraculous. And it was only in Israel and only in the time of the temple, whereas, you know, not relevant nowadays. Amar of Sheshef Asfasta Kerefet Bakar Damya. If, you're store, if you have a spasta downstairs, that's like a refa pakar that has a bad smell. That's the hay and stuff. It, it ends up with this bad odor that also can affect the neighbor. Okay, now we're going to do the next Mishnah. We'll end at the end of this next Mishnah. Very fascinating Mishnah and very relevant about okay, zoning laws. If you live in a residential area, can you turn your house into a, a store? Okay, nowadays people do this all the time. Doctors' offices in their houses. Um, you know, Dafiomi classes in their houses. Someone who did that. Um, happened to live in a small street and it did create traffic in the morning. Um, so all sorts of relevant things about what you're allowed to do and what your neighbor can prevent you from doing in your own house. So, If you share a courtyard with me and I have a dafyomi shir going on in my house and people coming all the time or people coming to buy and sell things, maybe dafyomi class might be different, but Am I allowed, are you allowed to say to me, listen, you have too many people coming in and out. It's bothering me. It's the noise. It's too much for me. You can do that. But if I, can, I create vessels in my house and I go and sell them in the shuk, you can't bother me about that, even though it makes noise, right? So, you can't complain and say the noise of the hammer banging or the noise of your millstone is bothering me, or the noise of the children is bothering me. Okay, this sounds like it could be your children or it could be children, and that's why I said maybe Deaf Yomi is different because children in the school might be different if they're learning from the rabbi, perhaps that's different. So now the big question is gonna be, and I'll leave this for tomorrow because we're really at the end here, but maybe we'll open with a few reasons, very different reasons among the commentaries for why we distinguish between a store and between theoretically, it sounds like it's a much louder noise, a bounding of a hammer. We all know how disturbing that is. But I can do that to create vessels in my house, which, by the way, is also work, 
right? I can do that, but I can't sell my house. And what's the difference between that noise and that noise? You can start thinking about it already, and we'll bring some some explanations tomorrow. So with that, we finished for today. So again, the whole first part of the DAF we already reviewed. I'm going to leave that aside. Then we got from there. We got off tangent about a, about salt in general and the melech stomid and the it, it's through knee, basically this making mechitzas out of salt. Then we went back to the mission of the Rechaim and the Tanur. We just spoke minor things that we kind of took from there. And then we got to this big issue about two people living one above the other, what things you can't do downstairs that will affect the upstairs, what things you can't do upstairs that will affect the downstairs. And you have to be concerned that you don't cause damage to your neighbor, what does cause damage, what doesn't cause damage. And then we move to the mission about the sound and what kind of sounds one can claim that's bothering me, you can't do that, and the other can't can't do, you know, and what things you can't complain about. And very interesting topic that we'll get more into tomorrow. Wishing everyone a good day.